Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue on in our study of Paul's second letter to Timothy. And today we'll be starting in the third chapter, having just finished the second chapter in our last last video. Amen. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. There's a, a, a lot of meat in there, as they say. This is an important chapter. It's a very, very important chapter. Mm -hmm. it, it's it kind is. of a sad chapter, too. Well, you know, I, having said that, I, I will make a little footnote here. There are no unimportant chapters, no, but this is an important chapter indeed. So we're going to start this, and we're going to start right at the first verse, or maybe even a, a tiny bit before the first verse, right after Mark asks for God's blessing on our time together today in his word. Oh, Lord, just... I know you're with us, but just open up our minds and our mouth to say and think what we need to to get what you want us out of your word today. And just, I pray, in, incorporate it in our lives so we can spread it and warn others. Amen. And at the end of the day, let there be less of us and more of you. In Amen. Jesus' name. Always, Amen. Always. All right, so we're going to talk about chapter three, but I just want to remind you how, where we left off, all right? Mm -hmm. So after encouraging Timothy to teach others to rightly divide the word of truth and to be patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, with the goal and the hope that they might come to their senses and be set free from the enslavement of sin to the devil and to the devil, Paul continues on to say, and now I'm going to be reading from chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. It starts with, but know this. Mine says, but realize this. Yeah, I know. You can get, yeah. But know, we should know it. That's true. <laughs> one says to understand this. Well, I'm using know in the biblical sense of the word, mm -hmm. all right? There were, because there's one thing to know, and there's another thing to have understanding. Mm -hmm. There's another thing to have revelation. I mean, these are things that we take for granted as being the same, and they're not quite, all right? Mm -hmm. But God wants us to know something. Mm -hmm. He wants us to know this. This is Paul writing to Timothy. These are the words of a realistic optimist. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's an important yeah, phrase, yeah. okay? Because a lot of times people think, well, you're not being optimistic. I'm being very optimistic, yeah. but I'm, you have to be realistic. Exactly. So you have to be a realistic optimist, yes. okay? Exactly. We have to be working in faith and desiring, like the Lord, that all men would come to, the re come to repentance and that none would perish. That's yeah. what Peter wrote in the second letter, right? Yet knowing that the words of Jesus are true, remember that he said... Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. Mm -hmm. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Matthew seven thirteen and 14. So Jesus talked about the many who will go the wrong way mm -hmm. and the few who will go the right way. And remember, he leads us in paths of righteousness for his That's name's sake. So it becomes a matter. He's very good at leading. We have to train ourselves to follow. Mm -hmm. Right? The many and the few. Unfortunately, when there are more and more people who disregard the commands and instruction of the Lord, there will not be a great revival, yeah. as so many are prophesying, and many are prophesying. They're looking forward to this great revival in the last yeah. days. But rather, there will be a great apostasy. Where do they go for scripture for that? They don't. Uh, I mean, but not, let's not go there. <laughs> it's, just, no, it's just the, the fact of the matter is scripture attests to about, And it's a good desire. I mean, you want to see people saved. That's what I'm saying. Right. You know, the heart of the Lord is that, that none would perish, but all come to eternal life. But the fact of the matter is when it comes to the last days, you better understand that what is coming is a great apostasy. Right. Many right? will fall away. That's what's foretold. Listen, Jesus 
when he was speaking of the, the signs of his coming in the end of the age in Matthew 24. And that's exactly what he said, right? You know, the, the apostles came and said, tell us what will be the signs of his coming in the end of the age, right? And he answered and said to them, this is from Matthew 24, verse 4. He said, see to it that no one misleads you. And then in verse 10, he said, at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. And then later, when Paul was writing to the church of Thessalonica, he said, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come, it being the great and terrible day of the Lord, it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, at 2 Thessalonians 2.3. So, I mean, there are two verses that are very, very strongly conclusive that before that coming of the Lord, there's yes. going to be a great falling away. And a man of perdition has to be in power. Yeah, yeah. but false prophets in the church, mm -hmm. always speaking pleasantries, yes. proclaim what is often called dominion theology or kingdom now theology. Right. I mean, right. there's a lot of that going around. And that's a belief that calls for the church to, and I put quotes around that. Mm. Take calls for the church to take over the world system now. Something that will not happen mm. until Christ comes, until he returns. I mean, why do you think so many Christians are involved in politics? politics they're they're saying looking saying. to get in, into power where they can right. straighten out the yeah. thing. The they're going to fix it. They're going to fix it, yes. In, in the political realm. So in that case, we had better know, right, that in the last days... Perilous times will come. This is the word of God. In the last days, perilous times will come. Now, the New American Standard Bible that I commonly use generally translates that as difficult times will come, right? For, and I, I always say this, for a lot of people, balancing a checkbook, that's difficult. Or changing a flat tire may be very difficult. There's a lot of things that can be difficult. Peril is, and I'm going to give you a dictionary definition, peril is exposure to injury, destruction, grave risk, jeopardy, and danger. That's what the dictionary says. Mm -hmm. That's what peril is. It's like walking through a landmine. Well, it, it, it's about being in constant in danger, right? And the description that Paul gives us here. Well, we're going to read that. Yeah, these are not difficult things. That's what we're going to talk about. These are perils. You're right. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. Because all of that said, Scripture interprets Scripture. So consider this. The only other time that that Greek word that's translated here as difficult or perilous, right? Mm -hmm. The only other time that it's used in Scripture is in Matthew 8, when Jesus... Now, remember, he's just going across the Sea of Galilee. This is when he stilled the, the storm, when the, the great storm arose in the boat. And when they get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, it says, when he came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. Matthew Matthew, 28. Matthew 8, 28. Oh, I thought you said 28. Yeah. 8, 28. Okay. I'm sorry, I may have. Matthew 8, 28, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it talks about extreme violence. And then the King James translates that phrase as these men were exceedingly fierce. The point is, it should be clear that what Paul is referring to, pointing to Jesus' encounter there, right? It's a time of demonic rage. It's a time of peril. A time of perilous danger even for believers. Because as the Lord said in his discourse on the last days, back to Matthew 24 again, mm -hmm. for then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. A time of great tribulation, right? The the it, the words exceedingly fierce was translated fierce. Like, yes, exceedingly fierce. Okay, was translated as difficult. No. Oh, you're missing. Oh, no, wait a minute. 
I, I, you're getting, I don't want to get anybody okay. confused right now. The word that is used in 2 Timothy chapter 3, right. that is translated as perilous or difficult, okay? That Greek word is used only one other time, and that's when Jesus encounters the demonic possessed men. Extremely violent. And it talks about them being extremely violent, right? Or exceedingly fierce, right. fierce or violent. Mm -hmm. So what we are talking about here is a time of demonic rage. And that's what you had better understand when you're talking about the end days, this right. perilous end days. We're talking about times when people become enraged. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I know we have people listening to this Bible study with us from, from many other countries. Mm -hmm. The simple fact of the matter is, if you understand what's going on here in America, there's no public discourse. There's no polite debating. Mm -hmm. There is rage in the streets. Yes, yes. When it comes to issues of social content, mm -hmm. when you talk, start talking about homosexuality or transgender, when you start talking about political action, there's no... There's no polite discourse. There's no reasoning. There's no reasoning. What you see is rage. That's right. That's And that's where we are going. It's absolute demonic rage. When they gather together. I mean, you know, remember in the last chapter, we were talking about the, the man of God is not supposed to be quarrelsome. Mm -hmm. You were supposed to be able to sit down and have decent discussions. We're going to have difference in our belief. Right. Not the gospel, but in things that we believe. Go to Romans 14 and see one person believes that the Sabbath is this day. and Don't get over it. Those things are, what's important is that we agree on the gospel. Go check 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and find out what it is. Otherwise, but what happens now, there's no polite discourse. There's no, what there is, is rage. I mean, people be, are becoming enraged and you see it everywhere you look. There are riots in the streets all over the United States of America. And this has been this has been happening because where it really got really bad was it started out with this road rage. Do you remember how bad that used to be? Well, I guess it still is. But I mean, I remember that as being so surprising that people would get so angry when somebody you know, angry to the off. point of trying to kill one exactly. another. Exactly. I mean, they go down. Well, and how start about shooting how about when it becomes political things today? Now like that's I, what I'm saying. It's like I, I mean, I'm seeing. I can't. It's it's difficult for me to believe. Now, I'm, I just turned 75, all right? I was born in 43. I grew up in a different age entirely. Yeah. Now, I grew up there, and I was a war baby. Mm -hmm. But that said, when, you know, I used to you see people, and they would get upset with one another. And they'd have, now, it's like they want to kill one another. Right. Right. They come on. There are people, I am not, I am not, I am apolitical, okay? Mm -hmm. Because my citizenship is in heaven. That's right. All right? My, you know, I'm, I'm here as an... A, a sojourner, an alien, a traveler just passing through this land. But I see Christians discussing politics today, and they are enraged with one another, right. and with the most filthy language pouring out of their mouths. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. It is horrible. It is so ungodly. But I don't, you know, I listen, mm -hmm. we are letting the world separate us. No. no listen, the world has no power over us. None at all. The world, the devil has no power. The world has no power. It's our flesh. It's our flesh. And we're going to talk about that for sure. Don't you ever believe, you know, there was a comedian. You probably don't know yeah. this. His name was a, a, a black fellow named Flip Wilson. Had a television show. I don't remember how many years ago. This must be 40 years ago or so. In the 70s or 80s. In any event, he used to do a skit. And it was a common skit that he did. Mm -hmm. And he'd come out and he'd say, the devil made me do it. Right. He'd do, oh, the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do anything. He cannot. He, cannot. he has no power over you. All he can do is talk you into doing. He can convince you to do what is wrong. Right. But he doesn't have the power to make you do anything. Right. Okay? Uh -uh. You better know that. Yes. Okay? Don't, don't. Because I see this so often, and I don't want to go off on a complete tangent. When people are talking about, oh, this Christian's demon possessed because he gets angry, it's, oh, you know, no. go read Galatians chapter five and see what the see what the deeds of the flesh are. Right. It's not demonic; it's deeds of the flesh. It's your flesh. That's right. Okay. So anyhow, when Paul starts talking about these perilous last days, these times of incredible danger, he starts describing the characteristics of the time. Mm -hmm. 
And he starts with this warning, right? Mm -hmm. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful and unholy. That's 2 Timothy 3, 2. Mm -hmm. Starts with lovers of self. That's pride. Yes. Now, listen and test this. Pride is the gateway to all sin. It's also the first thing mentioned in the list of the things that the Lord hates, things that are an abomination to him in Proverbs 6, uh, chapter 6, mm -hmm. starting at verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates, yea, even seven are an abomination to him. If you don't know that, go read it. Proverbs chapter 6. The first one is haughty eyes. The King James translates that as a proud look. It's pride. The first thing, the first thing in this list it's is pride. pride. The first thing in that list of, of the things that are abominable to the Lord, the it's first pride. one is pride. Mm -hmm. Pride opens the door to the enemy who is the father of lies, a liar by nature, and who is the enemy that's always scheming mm -hmm. against us to steal, kill, and destroy. Right. Pride opens the door to that. His attacks against us are not new, no. and neither are his methods. Okay? He has no creative power. Mm -hmm. He did one thing, it worked, mm -hmm. so he's still doing the same thing all these ages. Oh, it's true. Yeah. His first assault against mankind worked so well, he just continues to use mm -hmm. it. Our defense is not new either, mm -hmm. all right? For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. That's what Paul wrote in Romans 15, right? Right. So that being the case, let's go back to the earliest of times mm -hmm. and see the nature of Satan's tactics for his warfare. In, Gal in Galatians, in Genesis, oh. Barashit, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty or subtle than any beast of the field which the, God, which, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, Right? Yes. Yes, the Lord has said. And he continued on to say that the consequence of disobedience would be death. So the serpent continues on to proclaim that God's word is a lie. The serpent said to the woman, surely you will not die. Genesis 3, 4. God said, if you eat, you will die. Satan says, no, that's a lie. Mm -hmm. If you eat, you will not die. This is what's going on in the world today. Nothing has changed. There's nothing new under the sun, it says, right? Indeed, God has said, by the way, the opening salvo is always to question the truth of God's word. If I were to do a little Hebrew here, in the sense of, you know, reading from back to front, I would tell you we're in chapter 3, just starting chapter 3, but in chapter 4, Paul talks about the fact that in the last these last days, men will not endure sound doctrine. Right. So they'll accumulate for themselves teachers who, who choose to tickle their own ears, all right? They won't endure sound doctrine. The Word of God. You, you had better be devoting yourself to the Word of God. The only weapon that the devil has is his lying tongue. Mm -hmm. And our weapon, so they'll be able to resist in the evil day, is what it says in Ephesians 4, 6.13, is the word of God. That's right. Right? The sword of the Lord. Yes. Right? That's our weapon. The onslaught against the word of, of God today is so great and so consistent, mm -hmm. it has infected the entire church. Yes. I'm telling you the truth. I mean, there are there are people come you come to the Bible say they don't have Bibles. People go to church, nobody has a Bible, nobody brings a Bible anymore. Why? They're wrong, even if they do, half the time it's wrong translations, translations that are not faithful. They're abominable. Some of them. There are teachers that are saying that the accounts in the Bible are all fables or tale, tall tales. Mm -hmm. They don't believe it. Satan wants to disarm the saints. Mm -hmm. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. Satan doesn't want you to have that weapon. Yeah. That's what he fears. Is this not how Jesus defeated him in the wilderness? Satan attacks Jesus. Yes. Literally attacks him. And Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. That's what you have to have ready in your mouth, it is written. Because God did say this. 
So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Satan doesn't want you free. He comes to enslave you, to entrap you. So simply stated, if you don't believe the word or don't know it, or if you don't care enough about it to continue in it, to abide in it, then you will be convinced. You'll be convinced by the liar, just like the woman was, that you can make yourself like God. Isn't that what, isn't that what he said to the woman? Yes. You can make it. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, he said, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, 5. See, he's saying you don't need Jesus Christ. And without him, you can be right with God the Father or you can be your own God. It's pride. That's the ultimate pride. And pride is such a powerful force simply because we like it. Because we, in the natural, love us. We do. That's it's our nature. That's us. our human nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We love it until it fails. And then we hate ourselves or become desperate. We become desperate wretches without hope. And we can all, that can lead to either death or to life. It can lead to suicide or it can lead to the answer, right? And here is God's answer. You can conquer anything with an opposite and greater force. A greater power, yes. right? Okay. Either in the natural or spiritual realm. And there is also a God-given strategy for this battle. The force or the power is humility. Amen. Like Paul. Amen. Paul said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Second Corinthians 12.10. Humility is the opposite of pride. Humility is the opposite of love of self. And the strategy for victory is the truth, the word. So listen to God's strategy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. Love the Lord with all of your heart, right? Have this mind be in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2, 5-8. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 2. And he, Jesus, was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke 9, 23. Therefore, Peter wrote, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. First Peter 5, 6. And finally, be sober, be on the alert. Mm -hmm. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. First Peter 5, 8. Mm -hmm. Be on the alert. This is an important admonition from the word of God, particularly in this, the age of selfies and right. self-esteem. Yes and being all that you can be. Mm -hmm. I mean, the social motto in this perilous days is exactly that. It's all about selfies. It's all about self-esteem. It's all about self. Everyone's a winner. Well, that's what they teach. And that's what they be a loser, mm -hmm. all right? We just came back recently from uh, England and North Wales, and you know, we spent a lot of time over there, and we had a dear brother over there that I've mentioned here a number of times, Arthur Burke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Arthur passed away just a few years ago at 102 years old. He was still faithfully sharing the word at 101, right? He's a, a dear brother now going on to his reward. Hallelujah. He went home. He went home. But he wrote a wonderful little book, and certainly not a bestseller, I mm -hmm. promise you, yeah. entitled How to Be Ordinary. Mm -hmm. He said in that book, 
Humility is an obligation, not a virtue. You think about that, right? You don't have to work or struggle to be ordinary. No, we you are. are. We are. <laughs> you are. Uh, and if you, if you, if you, if your flesh is rising up against that at all, it's pride. Yeah. You are ordinary. Okay. Until you realize and accept that, you will neither know nor understand the fullness of the glory of our extraordinary Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who humbled himself. And then, as Paul wrote, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. And at that name, the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9 and 11, through 11. There's a plan. We are but ordinary clay in the hands of the master potter. Now, you may find it something of a battle to acknowledge it, right? Which is why Paul wrote to the Galatians and said, but I say, walk by the spirit and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, mm -hmm. so that you may not do the things that you please. Galatians 5, 16 to 17. Mm -hmm. Your flesh and your spirit, the that's where the battle is raging. Always. It's raging there all the time because pride is insidious. Mm -hmm. But when you can do that, when you recognize that you're ordinary and you rejoice in that fact, mm -hmm. then like the prophet Isaiah, you will joyfully proclaim, but now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are potter. And we are all the work of your hand. Isaiah 64, 8. Amen. We're the work of his hands, the master potter. We have nothing to do with it. I pray right now that none of us, Thank the bond servants of the Most High God, will ever fall into the trap of being a self-made man. Mm. Or woman, for that matter. <laughs> Is not proclaiming oneself to be self-made the absolute height of pride? Of pride? Yes. pride being a lover of self, which will tell you that you deserve it. Oh. Isn't that something you hear on advertising a lot today? Yeah. Oh, you deserve it. You know the only thing you deserve? Death. That's right. You're born in sin and the wages of sin is death. You didn't do anything to deserve salvation. It was a free gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. Thank God you don't get what you deserve, but you get the free gift of God, right? I'm telling you. That's right. When it comes to the world and the things of the world, if you believe that you deserve it, it will lead you to the next item in this hit list of top perils, mm -hmm. and that is love of money, being a lover of money. So I'm, I'm closing this, but I want you to think about this. I want you to think about Colossians, or Paul wrote to the Colossians, in Colossians 3.3. 3. He said, for I have died, and my life is hidden with Christ in God. The enemy can't see you if you're hiding in Christ. Mm -hmm. but then people won't see you. Oh, no. All right. But they'll see Jesus. And that's your ministry, brother. Mm -hmm. That's your ministry, sister. Is for people to see Jesus Christ when you show up. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of oh, God. God. And he also said, I must He must be. increase, mm -hmm. but I must decrease. Yes. Father, help us all to have a heart a desire to decrease, that there would be less of us and more of you, you that people would be able to see you every place that we go. They would see your love. They would see your joy. They would see your peace. All those are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Father, they would see all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that you have placed within us. Lord, that our lives would be a living testimony to your love. And I pray that, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Wow. Amen and amen. Well, amen. until next time, God bless you and goodbye. Think about it. Meditate on it. Ponder it. Get in the Word. Stay in the Word. Bye-bye. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind.